What's up, everybody? Welcome to NCSA Live. I'm your host, Danny Koenig. I am a senior recruiting coordinator here, former college swim coach, former college swimmer. I'm joined today by Max Irving. He is a water polo player. We are talking water polo today. Max, how are you doing? Doing well, Danny. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, of course. So uh, a couple good things to note here. Uh, NCSA is the official recruiting partner of USA Water Polo. We work with every varsity water polo program across the country, club programs included. It's been a really good partnership, I think, for high school student athletes that are looking to connect to college coaches, start to figure what's out there. Uh, it's a good platform to connect with those programs and start to get a beat on that. Max, obviously you went through that at some point yourself. I certainly want to dive into that a little bit, but yeah. I think, you know, First thing first, you know, you're a national team member. You're on Team USA. You played at a high level, All-American. You have a national championship under your belt. Yep. Not everything like that just fell out of the sky for you, right? You had to start somewhere. So tell me yeah. a little bit about your athletic history. Um, and I guess I know you were a swimmer, but at some point you did transfer over, over to water polo. So just walk us through that a little bit. I started my aquatic athletic career playing, uh, I mean, actually swimming. For a seal beach swim club here locally at the los alamitos base so yeah i started swimming when i was like seven or eight years old and then from there i transitioned into water polo where i played at uh shore aquatics in long beach we trained at uh, long beach wilson and uh long beach state and then there was kind of really where i fell in love with the game like from a very young age from like 10 years old and um just really just had fun going to training every day just enjoyed being in the water and just really found my love for the sport I mean, I just like I every opportunity that I had to play water polo, I just wanted to be in the pool. Every opportunity I had to swim, I wanted to swim. Like even growing up, like let's say I got like a C or D on some like a little quiz, like fifth grade, sixth grade, my parents would be like, okay, Max, no water polo for two weeks. And it would be absolutely crushing. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, just playing club, I was very fortunate to have really good coaches. Um, just being coached by like Shy Cradell, who went to, who was an Olympian, Robert Lynn, who was an Olympian himself. And played on the uh, two and was the assistant coach on the 2008 men's senior national team. So I mean, just yeah, playing club. That's really really got my foot in the door and kind of introduced myself to water polo and really found the love um, that I had for water polo. Yeah, so fortunate in a couple different ways, right? You had some really good coaches looking out for you. I think just being in the Southern California area is a hotbed for both swimming and water polo. But it can't go unnoticed that you had started at a pretty young age and you were doing two things yeah. at once, right? So you had started out club swimming, eventually transferred to water polo. But at some point you were doing club for both. Is that right? Yeah, so I was actually yeah swimming for Seal Beach Swim Club and um, yeah playing a little bit of club water polo with shore and that's kind of something that was like maybe a little bit of foreshadowing at the time because that mirrored like essentially what I did in high school because um, playing high school water polo at Long Beach Wilson a school with like a very rich aquatic tradition um, swimming was like a very big part of like our foundation of water polo and it is like a very big foundation of the game of water polo. So, I mean, that's something that I can really encourage everyone to be doing. It doesn't matter what age you're in. Maybe you're a senior in high school getting ready to go to go play your first year um, in college. Or maybe you're 13 years old playing club. If you can incorporate swimming into your club routine, I mean, it's just going to put you head and shoulders above your competition. So, yeah. swimming is something that I believe is very important. I mean, probably saying all the right things. You're a swim coach. For so sure. Here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that water strength is undeniable. Um, yeah. You know, football guys are strong, but water strength is something totally different. So yeah. um, you were doing two things at once. You were pretty heavily involved with competitive swimming. From what I understand, you did both through high school. But at some point, you had crossed over and started to focus a little bit more on the water polo yeah. side of things. Yeah. So uh, my freshman year, I tried out for uh, – I just – well, just coming into Wilson, we didn't really know what to expect. Me and, like, maybe 80 other guys. And um, – so yeah, going my freshman year, I make the JV team, me and one other guy, Jackson Kimball, who ended up going to Stanford. So we were, I mean, I was super excited to make that JV team. And um, yeah, I think things really just started to focus on water polo as I kind of had set that goal for myself. I mean, no, I really loved water polo and I kind of used swimming as more of like an avenue or an instrument to be able to like prop myself up and help myself um, continue to develop and continue to grow with my water polo. So, yeah, I think as I was going throughout my uh, – as I was progressing throughout my years in high school, definitely swimming yeah. as well. And I actually think you bring up a really good point, something I want to touch on that, you know, you had been doing this club for a while. You were a swimmer. You had pretty good water strength. And yet 
you still went into your high school season, your freshman year, a little bit nervous, right? Am I going to make the team? You know, am I good enough to do this? And you were really happy when you made the JV program at that point, which I think is interesting. You know, knowing where you are now, I think a lot of, you know, seventh and eighth graders kind of go through that. You know, am I going to be good enough to make the high school program? So tell me a little bit about that. Like, if you can walk back, kind of put yourself in that position, like, knowing what you know now, obviously it's a little bit different, but like at that time, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. I find that very interesting. Yeah. So uh, me and Jackson Kimball um, going into, I I mean, whenever you're going into a new environment, it's always going to be the same. I mean, you're always going to have some sort of nerves. Um, Yeah. You're going to be nervous going into it, but um, something that I really never tried to consider where other people my age might be, where other people, because like I, I obviously growing up, I wasn't one of the biggest guys wasn't one of the fastest guys, never threw the ball the hardest. So, I mean, I was pretty much always focused on myself and focused on what I could control. So going into my freshman year playing um, high school water polo at Long Beach Wilson, somewhere that has a very rich aquatic tradition, all I wanted to do, because I've been thinking about the guys that came before me, Tony Azevedo, Adam Wright, Shay Lapine, just with a really rich tradition at uh, Long Beach Wilson. So I was just trying to focus on, I want to be able to do something to like kind of add to this tradition. I want to be able to perpetuate this uh, idea that Long Beach Wilson has like a great aquatic tradition. So, I mean, I really just kind of came in with the mentality freshman year that I was just going to focus on myself. I mean, I was going to do everything to the best of my ability. Um, I was going to set some goals. I I knew I wanted to swim faster. I knew being on JV my freshman year, um, I wanted to be on varsity my next year. And even playing JV that uh, first year, I mean, it was an eye-opening experience for me. I still remember playing in some of those games and, like, the opposing team just, like, completely leaving me in the zone, just dropping off of me, just having no respect, just like, no, let, let this guy go. But, I mean, so I just tried to take all those things in stride. I mean, it's completely normal to feel nervous. It's um, to feel a little bit scared and things like that. But ultimately, like, you're going to – soon find this out as you continue to progress in your life that um, you can't allow things that you can't do or can't control to affect what you can do and what you can't control. And like something that's um, going into college your next year um, for some of you, I mean, that's something that's really exciting. And one of the most exciting things about that is just the um, responsibility you have and then the freedom you have, the freedom to like, make these certain decisions and choices that you can make that might not even be big choices, but just might be like the framework and the mindset that you might be going into a freshman year training with. Yeah. So there's, there's actually two really good points that I want to emphasize that you had brought up. Number one, you cannot control anything that anybody else does, especially if you're a freshman and some kid, there's just get a wide range of sizes and abilities and backgrounds. Right. But the only thing that you can really control is the amount of work that you put in, right. And being able to control what's in front of you and, and really kind of managing those things right there in front of you. But I think the other underlying thing is that you were nervous to go in there your freshman year, you know, for a program that has a really good long aquatic history and kind of, you know, looking back again on that now, how many times have you had to be in that situation where like, whoa, this is really nerve wracking and really kind of put yourself out there. And, and I guess in the coaching world, we always say it's being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, yeah. being comfortable, just not being in a situation that's very familiar to you. So for you young athletes out there, Put in the work, put in the time. You're the only one that can control that. But then beyond that, don't be afraid to put yourself out there because that's that tends to be how good things happen for yeah. you, right? You're going to get very yeah. comfortable with that. So love those two things. Um, so let's come back to a little bit of the recruiting side of things here. Yeah, Clearly, you were very invested in your sports, doing two things at once. Did you know basically that whole time that you wanted to go on and compete in college? Yeah, I mean, uh, coming going into Wilson, I – because I actually chose Wilson with a lot of the freedom of the high school, freedom of high school stuff that there is uh, now surrounding the high school games. I actually didn't go to my home school, which would have been Long Beach Millican. I live over here closer to Rossmore in uh, Long Beach. So I actually went to Long Beach Wilson. So, I mean, even just making that decision kind of um, was, I had in the back of my mind that I wanted just to be as good as I could be. And I wanted to be in a place where I was going to play competitive water polo which would ultimately take me up to the level where I could uh, compete at the collegiate level. So, I mean, that was definitely a major goal for me going into high school. So always part of the plan. It was never a consideration. This is always just kind of a well-known that you wanted to go on and compete in college. So at what point did you start to take a pretty serious look at your opportunities and maybe even start to act on that? Do you remember what that process was like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, 
I actually wasn't too highly recruited coming out of high school. I mean, so this is something that might come to a surprise for some people, but um, water polo is a small sport. I mean, so you got you have guys who are pretty established with like youth teams, junior teams, national teams, and those guys are going to be pretty um, high regarded with uh, recruiting. But then there's a lot of great players like me. I was like um, maybe like a bit of an undersized guy, a question mark, wasn't coming from maybe like the best school, hadn't been on so many national teams. But um, so I remember I was contacted by USC initially, and then a couple smaller schools like Santa Clara, LMU, Pepperdine, UCSB isn't so much of a smaller school, and then uh, finally UCLA. So I mean, I didn't have a ton of uh, like offers out on the table, and I think that could, that is something that might be a little bit of a misconception with college water polo. I mean, it's not going to be like NCAA basketball or NCAA football where you're going to receive 60 letters in the mail. I mean, so you, if you have something, I mean, you, you're very fortunate for being able to have that opportunity. So you were pretty much only hearing from schools in California. Do you know why yeah. that might have been? I mean, I just think of um, it, it, they kind of the schools in California kind of aligned with what my water polo and aquatic goals were at the time. I mean, I was really focused on, um, I wanted to go to school and just try to continue to get better. I mean, I thought that I could go somewhere and uh, make an impact and try to play for my first year. And then also just I, like, for example, with my um, recruiting process, something I think that guys, you really need to ask yourself is like, kind of like, where do you fit in and what necessarily do you want? So for me, it was really easy because I knew I just wanted to compete at a high level. I wanted to play at a high level and I wanted to compete for national championships. And for me, I mean, that's great. If you want to go to college and you understand the time commitment that's going to be going to a division one school, then that's great. But I mean, you really have to consider a lot of things when you're choosing where you're going to spend. I mean, for example, if you're thinking about college, the next four years, I mean, it's where you're living. It's um, it's those, your teammates are going to be your best friends. I mean, the people who you're around are they going to be the people who to mold you to the person that you're ultimately going to become. So that's interesting. And I want to come back to this a little bit. You know, you had talked about going somewhere and being an impact player immediately. And yeah. your freshman year was maybe a little bit different than some are going to have an experience on. And I want to touch on that here in a little bit. So let's come back. Um, you know, so you were, you, you kind of took the passive approach with recruiting. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say so. Kind of wait I mean, for I, I, to come I, back I, to you. Yeah. I mean, I was obviously trying to do as much as possible, uh, send emails where I could tell coaches I was playing at this pool for JOs. I mean, just try to send out as much information as possible, but um, yeah. Okay, so you were you were being proactive on it, right? Yeah, definitely I would consider that I was being proactive, but um, just kind of like the nature of water polo, it's not like super, it's not super glamorous in the recruiting process. I mean, sometimes the most that you're going to get would be, uh, I mean, phone calls, emails, and then recruiting trips in junior days, I think are sure. really big. Well, and let's be honest, for the very vast majority of us, the recruiting process isn't that glamorous. You know, yeah. Unless you're top tier D1 basketball, D1 football, you know, nobody's really paying attention. So it really does need to come down to what you want to get out of the process and your goals. So to a degree, you're hearing from some schools, you're reaching out to some schools. When did that process start for you? What year of high school? So that actually really things started to pick up. I think um, my senior year of high school, actually, like um, I think halfway through my senior season, maybe so November, like, yeah, November or early okay. November of my senior year. Which is I, admittedly pretty late, I think, for yeah. most cycles and most sports. I mean, did you have teammates at that time that had committed maybe in junior year and figured it out? I mean, do you consider yourself late? Yeah, I mean, I think that was pretty late, and but that's something that I didn't really allow to affect me because I actually had one of my teammates, the guy who I, Jackson Kimball, who I made uh, the JV team with my freshman year at Long Beach Wilson, he had already committed to Stanford. I mean, he, he was an excellent student, excellent water polo player, and when you get an opportunity to go to Stanford, I mean, that's not something that you usually pass up. Right. So, um, so he was, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I had friends that were pretty committed and going to great schools, and that honestly, I would say it did cloud my judgment for a little bit just because you're, I was like a little bit anxious to try to get into things, but um, I really just tried to take it slow. I tried to go on my recruiting trips because I know like Jackson, for example, he didn't go on his recruiting trips because I mean, when you get into Stanford, you go to Stanford. Right. But um, for me, yeah, I just tried to take my time, not allow what was going on around me and hearing other people committing to other schools uh, really defect, affect my decision. I just really wanted to take my time and understand that, the decision that I was making in these next um, like couple months, where it's going to be a decision that I'm going to have to live for for the next like four.
four years forever. of your life. Yeah, yeah. forever. And that, yeah, exactly. And like the things that you're going to learn in college and the, the classes you're going to take, they're going to equip you for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And you guys can't see it. He's wearing a uh, UCLA polo. He'll be yeah. repping the Bruins forever, right? Forever. I'll be repping I mean, Wisconsin forever. That's just part of the deal. Oh, my, so my brother, I really my brother appreciate actually, that. Yeah, Wait, my say that again? Badger. My brother's a Badger. He went to, he graduated in like, I think he graduated, we were talking about like yesterday, 2015, 2014. But I mean, okay. he absolutely loved Wisconsin. Very cool. Loved Wisconsin, yeah. Very cool. Love that connection. So, um, so, so interesting. So you were a little bit more methodical. You took your time with it. You kind of understood the value, you know, in the long term and making that decision that was good for you, despite anything that your teammates were doing at that time. A little bit late to the party, but I find it very interesting because this is something that we talk a lot about with our you know student athletes that we work with we definitely recognize this as former college coaches that you know the necessity for you to take ownership of your own recruitment and push some of that stuff out and i want to kind of dive into that a little bit more because i think that can be a really scary thing for a lot of high school athletes to do to contact a coach and say hey coach i found your program i think i'm good for what you're looking for so kind of number one what was your methodology for finding some of those schools? I mean, how did you go about narrowing that stuff down? And then what was your methodology for actually communicating with those college coaches? Yeah. Okay. So with this, um, yeah. So, I mean, with the college coaches, I pretty much did everything through email. I mean, that's a form that I have felt pretty comfortable with just reaching out. I thought I could like write, type down what, however I was feeling and express whatever feelings I wanted and send to a coach. And they'll usually get back to you within two to three days. Um, for me, yeah, when I was kind of thinking about the schools I wanted to go to, I knew I wanted to play water polo. I knew I wanted to be able to compete for national championships. I um, I knew I wanted to continue to grow and continue to elevate, and I wanted to be, and I wanted to go to a school that was going to push me to do that. And so after kind of going through those things and checking those boxes, um, UCLA and going on my recruiting trips, I mean, that's something that I try to stress to every kid who's in high school. Um, and they're kind of thinking about the next stage of athletics is please guys go on your recruiting trips. I mean, when you go on your recruiting trips, imagine that you're at that school, really try to see how you would fit in with even the, only the atmosphere, the campus, where it is. Do you want to go far away to school? Do you want to stay close to home? Um, just like take it in with the guys, like how is the guys like, so when I went to my recruiting trip um, to UCLA, the guys, they were just, it was like a big, it was a big group. It was like a family. I mean, so I really just saw that just the, like the levels of the connections between all of the guys from the guys who were seniors to guys who were down like freshman year guys who were just coming in. So, I mean, once I saw that in the atmosphere, I kind of knew UCLA was a place personally for me where I wanted to go. And um, yeah, so my decision was kind of easy, but you, yeah, like you said, the personal responsibility that is kind of taking your recruiting into your own hands. I mean, it's only going to benefit you, you know? So like, cause, because once, once you get to college, let's say your parents helped you out parents helped you do everything you're kind of doing things to please them they're going to be gone i mean you're going to be the one who's dropped off at that freshman year in your dorm room sitting sitting with whoever your roommate might be and then you're going to be there for the next four years so i mean the more work you do now and early and just like it's just going to set you up so you're going to be a lot more satisfied and you're going to have a lot um a greater you're going to have a greater understanding of where of the place that you're going that you're going to call your new home that's right. And I, I, that's really good perspective, right? You can't rely on anybody else to do your recruiting for you. I think it's funny that you look back and, you know, you went on your visits and say, hey, you know, it was an easy decision to make about UCLA. But I, I'm sure at that time, your recruiting process was not that easy, right? Yeah. Doing research, figuring out which programs are recruiting your position, putting together those intro emails, kind of juggling all this stuff. And of course, it culminates in these official visits, right? Or it should, or, or you want yeah. it to. So, you had received, did you go on five official visits? So I ended, I went on three official visits. I went to UCLA, LMU, and UCSB. Okay. And was, so how did those line up? Like just chronologically, was UCLA the um, last one? No, I think I went to UCSB. No, yeah, UCSB, UCLA, and then LMU. Okay, cool. So you went to Santa Barbara, Loyal Marymount, uh, UCLA, and I think this is a very underrated aspect. And, I, and there was something that you had mentioned here. Not all those schools are going to be a good fit, right? I recognize that as a coach and certainly as an athlete at times, although, you know, when you're 17, 18, it's kind of a blur, right? Absolutely. But I think 
you get onto campus, you, you do what you can, you do your homework, you know you're interested in these schools, you take what could be up to five official visits, and undeniably, every single campus has a vibe. Every team, yep. every program, you come there, and it's really tough to predict what's going to jump out at you. So I guess what stuck with you about UCLA, maybe, and we're not trying to bash any of these other programs, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Right. It's going to be right for somebody else versus, you know, another person that might not mm -hmm. like UCLA to the same degree that you did. But what are some of those feelings that you got? You know, I know you mentioned the team, but what are some of those un un intangibles, I guess, maybe yeah. about the academics or some of the other things that really drew you to UCLA? All right. So I'll just go real quickly. Um, this might not be relevant for any of you guys, but it was relevant for me. So that's why I'm going to talk about it. But uh, I went to, when I went to UCSB. I mean, I had a great time. Wolf Wago is an awesome coach. They had an awesome team. But when I went there, I, I think I went in maybe January, March, but it was absolutely freezing. I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I personally like. Now I know really, why you didn't like, look at Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like simple things like that. Just, I mean, like little things like that where I was like, man, I'm freezing. I just remember like just being freezing there for like three nights straight. So I was like, or two nights. And I was like, okay, this is this. Places and there great, it is. But, I and mean, that's one of those strange team. intangibles. It was yeah. cold. You yeah. can't control that as a coach if it's cold. You know, you put out a good product and try and showcase the program, but you were physically uncomfortable for 48 yeah, yeah. hours because of the weather. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So that's okay. Awesome. Okay. I said so then LMU. I mean, um, I went to Long Beach Wilson, I think, has four uh no, four thousand total students. So then when I went to LMU, I think LMU has maybe eight thousand or maybe somewhere around there, but LMU is a, a lot smaller of a school. So everything was a lot more quiet. I mean, um, so that's not really necessarily what I thought I had in mind for my college experience, just because I was already coming from a high school that was like a bigger high school. And I remember sitting in on some classes um, at LMU when I was there on my recruiting trip. And I remember the classes were just so intimate. It was like 15 people. Like if you check your phone, the professor's gonna see you're on your phone. So, I mean, that's just like another thing, just small things like that. So LMU was kind of a little bit of a smaller school for me and didn't really have like the necessarily big feel of like the school I wanted to like really go to. And then when I went to UCLA, um, it was a big school. There are a lot of people there. I kind of saw like the level of water polo because I was able to watch a couple of trainings. Um, and then I just saw the way that the guys interacted. I mean, how Adam interacted with the team. And I just kind of saw like the family um, aspect and the family values that they really had at UCLA. So I kind of thought that was something that I really liked. And I, that was somewhere where I thought um, I could see myself fitting in. It, it was, it ended up being close for home, close to home for me and still in Southern California. So those were all things that I knew I liked. And so, I mean, it just, UCLA like really made a lot of sense for me. I mean, that didn't, that, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. And again, that's going to be different from somebody else that maybe was on your, you know, official visit that ended yeah. up going somewhere else. You know, there were maybe some things that they did not like about UCLA, but that was a good decision for you. Um, you went through that process. And, you know, again, as a former college coach, you want to do everything you can to showcase your program to the best of your ability and do that as honestly as possible. And that still isn't going to come across for some people, even if it's a pretty close match. So all is fair. Right. And that's just yeah. part of the game. And we understand that. So you go on your visit to UCLA. You like it there. I think you said you had one other visit after that. Were you offered a scholarship at some point by UCLA at that point? Um, so I think after I had a couple of meetings with Adam Wright, but like that's something you kind of have to understand with water polo, like uh, the recruiting process that might not be as glamorous as football and basketball. The scholarships, I mean, just the sheer financial benefit that uh, these schools are able to offer you athletically for your athletic ability. I mean, water polo is just, uh, a sport with four and a half. Uh, scholarship. So, I mean, like a good player who was kind of under recruited as myself, I was offered merely books going mm. in. So, I mean, but they obviously, I mean, I think most coaches kind of give you the opportunity, like as you continue to progress with the program to, um, to earn more scholarship and you'll have a uh, continue to earn your opportunities. But um, yeah, I mean, so wasn't offered like a ton of money and a glamorous deal, but I mean, for that, like that, it, that's something that didn't necessarily affect my decision making so much, but it definitely can affect decision making. Yeah, it can. But I think at the end of the day, some of the things that you had said, you know, you knew that school was a good fit for you. You had taken your visit. You thought you were going to fit in well with the program. You kind of had this broader picture like, hey, you know, this is a 40 year commitment, not just a four year commitment. And accepting yeah. books was OK at that time. Now, you know, you had the roster spot. You knew that coach was interested in you. 
um, you know, a lot of good things ended up coming from this down the line. And it sounds like you made a very good decision. So, yeah. and this is the one that I wanted to come back to. All right. So you, you take your visit, you were offered books, you, you show up at, at your, your freshman year at UCLA and you redshirted your freshman year. Tell me a little bit about that process. I think it's something we don't talk about a lot, which is yeah, why I want I mean, to touch on it. Tell me a little bit about the redshirt experience. Yeah. So the redshirt experience, yeah, going in, I mean, when you're going into a school like UCLA, um, a freshman, sometimes what they, they would just like to think that maybe you'll be more useful to the program on the back end as a fifth year senior than you would be at as, as a first year senior, especially with guys who might already be fifth year seniors. You have guys who are four year seniors, you have guys who have, are redshirt juniors. So you have guys who've been kind of in the program for two, three, four, and five years. So unless you're going to be able to make an impact and kind of get in right away, I think, in my opinion, that redshirting can be um, it can be a very useful tool and can be like something that you can almost use as a weapon just because you kind of know that if you're able to stick it out to continue to commit um, through playing in college, that in the back end, like hopefully it will be worth you not playing that first season. Because when you go in your first season, I mean, you start training with the team in the summer and then the fall pretty much, as soon as you start your classes, you will have already played in three or four games. So it really picks up quickly. So, I mean, redshirting can be something also that's great to help you adjust into the academic and athletic life. Because when you go from high school to college, I mean, you just have to understand that it's going to be a huge level up in what you're used to, both athletically and academically. So, I mean, redshirting can just definitely be an asset that you can use. Now, was this discussed throughout your recruitment, or was that something that was addressed once you had arrived at campus. How did that process go between the conversations you and your coach? Yeah, so the redshirting conversation um, wasn't really discussed a lot when I was being recruited, but more so once I had arrived to UCLA. Um, I remember we had our freshman summer camp, summer training camp, and there was it was me and one other guy who were kind of on the fence whether we were going to redshirt or not. And then after the end of maybe two or so weeks um, with the team, training with the team, the coach kind of getting a feel for what you can do and how you can be implemented into the team and be an effective piece of the team. Um, we kind of came up, me and Adam Wright, we came to the decision that it would be better if I redshirted. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that conversation is like a conversation in itself. I mean, no coach can tell you that you're going to redshirt. The coach can merely say, hey, I think it is within your best interest and I think it's within the best interest of our program if we can have you as a fifth year opposed to playing your first year. Because, I mean, the only reason why um, you would redshirt is because the coach thinks maybe you need more time. I mean, and this isn't the end of the world, I would say, for a lot of guys. A lot of guys can be discouraged by redshirts. A lot of guys will go into college and say, I'm not, I'm not going to redshirt. Like, that's just not something I'm going to do. I'm a high, high-profile athlete, high-profile player, and I'm going to play immediately. And then if that's something that uh, you know and, like, you, something that you value, then more power to you. But sure. just, um, just under, yeah, just kind of understanding, like, really what redshirting is and how it can be used as a benefit. Yeah, definitely. And again, you could have gone somewhere, been an impact player immediately, even for a lot of D1 yeah. programs. But you were doing things that were good for you that didn't just have to do with water polo. Again, you're there for school. You wanted that big environment. You knew what you were getting into. UCLA water polo is very, very good. And I think it is an honor to just be part of that program. I think, you know, the tendency is to maybe be a little bit disappointed, you know, if you want to be a contributor immediately. But you made it work, right? You had a good five yeah. years there. You were a big time contributor. So, you know, I guess big story, you know, you started early, you were doing a lot of different things. I think you played it right. You played your hand, you know, in the right way and it ended up working yeah. out well for you. Kind of looking back on some of that stuff, what, what advice do you give to somebody who's maybe 13 or 14 year old, you know, they're thinking about this here a little bit. Like, as you think back, you know, what do you want to tell the athletes in high school now that they should really be focusing on? I think um, what, if you're an athlete in high school now, just I would say focus on having love for the game. I mean, enjoying the game, have a lot of fun playing, enjoy training, enjoy playing in the games. I mean, if you think that like water polo is a little bit of a drag or you're playing it just for your friends, you're playing it for your parents. Um, once you kind of take the step to the next level, you are really going to understand the time commitment that water polo is and playing at a division one level is absolutely a huge time commitment. I mean, for me personally, I only had time for like water polo school and like besides that, nothing much else because in season you're doing maybe five, six hours a day in the winter. You'll actually have a little bit of time to have some fun only training four times a week, two hours. And then in the spring things start to ramp back up three hours a day. And then 
in the summer, it's pretty much unlimited until you start season in uh, late August, mid late August. So, I mean, just understanding the time commitment that it's going to be. So if you can uh, have like that foundation and like love for the game and enjoy playing water polo, then when things do get tough and when you are putting in these long hours and when you kind of are grinding, you still understand why you're doing it and you understand how much joy this game gives you. And then you can kind of like fall back on that. So, I mean, that's something I would try to tell my younger self or tell uh, some younger athletes who might be in high school, just like have fun with it, try to swim as much as possible. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. I think that's great. Enjoy. Great feedback. Um, you have to know what you're getting into. And I know there's yeah. a lot of perceived glory at the D1 level. You know, you and I have both done that. But that's what we were looking for. And we kind of knew what that commitment was, that being an athlete at that level is a full-time job. And you have to be fully prepared for that, right? So not only yeah. the ability to be at that level, but understanding once, what that commitment is once you get there. Um, so just understanding that there is absolutely nothing wrong with being a D2, D3, NAI athlete, even going to junior college and transfer. It's an option, yeah. right? I There's mean, scholarships yeah, you, all over the place for that type of stuff. So yeah. um, the only other one that I would throw out there that I find incredibly valuable, and this is really from the coach's perspective, I'll yeah. be upfront. I didn't place this kind of perspective as an athlete when I was in high school grades. <laughs> there you go. Um, just be, getting oh, it done yeah. in the classroom. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, cause you, what you don't want to do is rule yourself out of um, going to school somewhere before you even really are in contention or if you're in contention to go to school somewhere, but if you have to make a minimum of a GPA requirement and you're not able to get that, you're really going to be kicking yourself in the butt thinking that, wow, my sophomore year and my junior year of high school, I should have just studied instead of playing Fortnite or doing nothing. Because like mm -hmm. the things that you think that aren't going to affect you now are definitely going to affect you later on. And these are also, um, I mean, you're forming habits when you're young. So like if you're just going to mess around, not take class seriously when you go to um, a prestigious university or when you start university, I mean, it's going to be a very tough adjustment if you're going to all of a sudden have to start hitting the books hard like come up with a new studying regime and routine and everything like that. So, I mean, and take yeah, a step forward in your sport, try and do two exactly. things at once. Yeah. So I could, yeah. Academics, just if you're able to have an underlying um, sense of pride with your academics and really take them seriously, I mean, it's just going to equip you for the rest of your life. Well, sure. And I know you've thrown out Stanford. They have academic standards there that they can't play with. Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, I, I, wasn't, a, I wasn't eligible to make it to Stanford. I mean, just no, I wouldn't have been. Just, Absolutely not. Yeah. I don't think I would have gotten into Wisconsin on my own. Yeah. My, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot to be considered there. And again, the college coaches, they don't want to risk. You know, they want somebody that already knows how to handle their business in the classroom and in the water. Um, so they're looking for those higher GPAs, knowing that those kids can handle a lot at one time. So, um, yeah, Max, I really appreciate you being here with us. We got to wrap things up here. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I know you're an Olympic hopeful, a lot to look forward to. Things have shifted a little bit here, which is yeah. cool. You know, I hope we see you out there next year. Um, it's tough. That's a tough path, and I think everybody knows that. So wish yeah. you the best I mean, yeah. on that front. You've accomplished a lot. Incredibly impressive. Thank you for being here today, imparting some of the wisdom here for our younger student athletes. Um, any closing remarks here? Anything you want to let the people know? Um, yeah, I guess just that, like, I mean, as you guys are continuing to grow and enter a new phase of your life, like I'm essentially doing the same thing. I mean, I'm Olympic hopeful. I'm looking to take that next step in my life, like playing water polo professionally and uh, playing water polo at the national team at Olympic level. I mean, so yeah, you're like necessarily your problems change and like you continue to have different goals, but like the things that you guys are going through now are the same things that I'm going through to this day. That's right. Some are just trying to make it from eighth grade onto their freshman team. And that's a big enough jump for them at that time. So again, exactly. NCSA, okay, um, official recruiting partner of USA Water Polo. We work with every water polo program out there, including a UCLA. I want to thank Max yep. for being here today. Um, like I said, imparting some wisdom here has been a great conversation. Um, again, come back to ncsasports.org for more information on that partnership, how to get recruited to water polo or for your individual sport. We will see you guys very soon. Take care. All right, Dave, thank you for having me.